How many people did people do you have online? Uh, we're down to about 35 or so. So our next speaker is Dr. Jean Piero Palermo. We are beginning our Italian segment of our day today. <laughs> All of the rest of our speakers are Italian, and I tried to find a little Italian flag that we could, <laughs> could put up here. Um, when I realized that the agenda was, I thought, oh, wow, this is really kind of a, uh, um, a pizza crowd. Um, we shared the Gabay Award at Brandeis University, and it's been 14 years ago. And it was an interesting evening. The Gabay Award at Brandeis is in for some kind of innovation, and we shared it with them. Um, um, and so I'm going to ask Jim Perrault to introduce his own background. Now we know for, I mean, everybody in this room understands that he invented the technique called intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And he can tell us whether it was on purpose or an accident. Um, and he has been doing research now at Cornell for many years. Um, so it's our real pleasure that you would come this afternoon. I just don't know where you were before. Sure. So then I would like to thank uh, Anne Kissling, Dr. Kissling, and Dr. Albertini for the kind invitation. Well, my background, I was an OBGYN in Italy, and then I decided to do a sabbatical in Belgium. And when I went there, this was in 1988, they told me that they had a problem with male factor. I thought I'm a gynecologist, I don't know anything about sperm, but um, I listened. So I started to work on sperm and I was fascinated by micro manipulation procedure and uh, start to mess around and, and I developed ICSI. Um, they told me not to do ICSI because there were some people in, in Singapore, Eng, and other people that have tried, they didn't have any success. So, and I think we see the week in, uh, in Norfolk, so they told don't even try, do subzonal injection. Uh, by doing subzonal injection, Serendipitously, one sperm went to the side, but I told my technician, you know, to leave the history, in the, um, to leave a track in the history of medicine, we should have a pregnancy with intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So he turned around and said, we have it. So it was a patient with 12 oocyte, only one fertilized, and um, was because the sperm went inside the side. I put a question mark was about the, the egg was going to die. But that was the um, day two we transferred for cell embryo was the first ICSI pregnancy. So uh, we're not going to have that means. Okay, so uh, let's start together. Uh, give you a sample of what we do. We know that for reproduction, at least in mammals, we need the sexual reproduction. We need two gametes, um, each of the oocyte and the spermatozoa. They have to kind of mature, develop within the respective organ with the ovary or the testicle. So if you look at the infertility indication, if we exclude one third between combined and unexplained four, is equally distributed between the female and male infertility. That's appear clear now. So if we evaluate the male partner, we know we look at developmental history, medical history, social history, and um, sexual history, but then we perform a physical examination and we everything pivot around the, the semen analysis. The semen analysis is normal, then we focus on the female partner. If it's abnormal, then we look at further evaluation, hormonal, et cetera. And this we do together with our reproductive urologist. And um, if these get tweaked and get corrected, otherwise we just focus on the best assisted reproduction, assisted fertilization method on in vitro insemination. So the semen analysis, you know, everybody say passe, but anyway, it's important to assess male infertility still today. And we have ancillary tests as um, abstinence, volume, and viscosity. Most important are concentration in morphology, motility if present, otherwise we look at the viability, as well as other cells. So this is a picture of the intracytoplasmic sperm injection. It was my pride to bring down the ratio to the gamete one to one to make the spermatozoa as important as the oocyte. You can see there is a huge discrepancy in volume of the two cells. So this is Cornell ART. We celebrated this year 30 years of ICSI. So this is about 61,000 cycle of ART at Cornell since I joined the group. In the beginning, we were doing 32% of ICSI procedure. In 2002, became 73. 
And since 2012, we've been traveling over 90%. Now we are around 95, 96% of uh, ICSI procedure overall of them. And um, if you look at the case of 45,700 ICSI cycle in these 30 years, we have 89% with the jaguar from Amazon and it's more about 10% with surgical in three. If we look at the ejaculated uh, from Amazon with ICSI, um, we have 40,000, the maternal age about 38 years of age with a big standard deviation. And we have the semen parameter about 17% uh, with apparently normal semen parameter. The large majority have at least one semen parameter compromise. So um, over 348,000 on site injected, 97% survive. We have a 78% of normal fertilization, about three to 6% with abnormal. We can use any source of spermatozoa with ejaculator, retroejaculator, retrograde. We have a fertilization between 74 and 76%. In a clinical pregnancy rate, that mean at least the presence of one fetal heartbeat between 37 and 46%. So if you look at the indication of the factor of infertility, all um, can compromise the presence of spermatozoa into the ejaculate, where varicocele, cryptorchidism, um, hormonal abnormality, et cetera. But the most important is isospermia. It's about 30% of the case that equally distributed between obstructive and non-obstructive. If we look at the case of isospermia, 3,000 cycle performed at Cornell in those years, you see the maternal age is much younger, 36 years of age, we have about two thirds with testicular spermatozoa, one third with epididymal. So, if you look at the obstructive exospermy, mostly congenital bilateral absence with vast deference, unreconstructive vasectomy, infection of trauma. And the approach is percutaneous, but what we master at Cornell, the open approach, we go directly, we open and we go directly to the epididymis. And if the epididymal approach is not available, we do percutaneous testicular biopsy. There are cases where the spermatogenesis compromised, so we go to sickle assembling. We have some of those 322 performing individuals. The epididymal approach was not available, so they mostly are non obstructive as ospermic. And of those, only really three spermatozoa in 62% of the cases. So for non obstructive as ospermia, likely we have mostly hypospermatogenesis in about half of the cases where we retrieve spermatozoa. The other half is equally distributed between maturation at rest and germ cell ablation and no spermatozoa most of the time are available. So this is the standard biopsy and this is the micro taste that we use at Cornell. So when you look at the fertilization rate in green fresh sample and in blue cryopreserve, you see the fertilization for ejaculate is identical. When you see the epididymal, similar 70%, but the testicular, in the best of the case, reach barely 50% with the fresh of their reserve. When you look at the clinical pregnancy, we have about 60% with epididymis spermatozoa and 45% with testicular. With this, with the fresh, if you use cry reserve, it's significantly lower, but still clinically valuable. A 46% for the epididymis, 38% for the testicular. Within each procedure, the fresh specimen outperform the cry reserve. So we look at the spermatozoa, you see this, the spermiogenesis, about 22, 23 days in the human. And you see they have to undergo certain changes with the Golgi apparatus to form the acrosomal cup and then migrate to form the bow tire, like we call it, at the mid piece. And um, then finally is this developed sperm that we have learned, you know, in the past we thought it was just a vehicle for the genome, but now we know it brings the acrosome, it brings the centrosome, it brings the small RNA that are all very important for the pre-fertilization step of the early conceptors. So we can assess the capacity, maturity, the competence of the agrosomal cap by using the cap score from Alex Travis here. And you, this is a very important test because it can tell you if you, have, you can try with um, a, you know, pro, program intercourse, or if you want to do uterine insemination, or we do standard in vitro insemination. If the score is uh, negative, if fail, then you want to proceed with it directly. So you reduce stress and cost for the patient. So, but even with it, we have failed fertilization as we go to the topic to, today. So we have log, uh, yield, log L yield, we have abnormal fertilization, 1 pn and 3 pn, but we have loss of absence of the PLC zero. 
we also inability, as Dr. Hendricks mentioned, of the OSI to actually fertilize. So we did a study here in 2020 of fertility sterility, and we look at all the ICSI cases of a fertilization less than 10%. So we assess the PLC zeta. If the PLC zeta was present, then we focus on the stimulation protocol to try to improve the maturity of the old plasma. But if it's present, if it's absent, then we do confirmatory mouse or site activation test, and then we perform assisted gamete treatment by oocyte activation. We also did some genomic assessment. So these are 52 couple where actually you see the, the demographic here. And uh, these are patients with their PLC zeta. And when we look at the control here, we do 52 cycle here, we got uh, a good number of mature oocyte, but only fertilization 2% non-clinical pregnancy, even if we transfer a few embryos. But those who modify the superovulation by increase the time between the ECG, for example, and the time of retrieval, the time of removal of the cumulus cells and the time of retrieval, it's a really important factor for plasma maturity. You see that the fertilization rate increased 59%. We got a 32% clinical pregnancy in the same individual and a 25% of injury. So then the case of globus of spermic, Patient, they don't have any PLC zeta, 24 couple here, demographic, 27 cycle control. You can see here that actually 230 oocyte, 85% mature, 9% fertilization, few embryo transfer, no pregnancy. When we use assisted oocyte activation, we got here comparable number of mature oocyte, 42% fertilization, 25 embryo transfer, 36% clinical pregnancy, and six delivery. And this is the last uh, um, acquaintance. So um, we also did the genomic analysis. We see that the gene involved that it actually mutation um, where those related here to the PLC zeta, PIC1, SPAD, all involved in the acrosomal development. Some of them are also responsible for early embryo development. So we know that the organization of the chromatin into the sperm is very complex is mostly around the core of protamine, but there is a small proportion between 15 and 16% still bound to Eastern. And we thought because it was incomplete um, kind of protamination of the sperm DNA. Well, I think this uh, portion, which are very sensitive to damage and kind of assessed by DNA fragmentation, are very important for the prefertilization step, kind of guide the OSI to this step for the, the condensation of the of the male pronucleus and the early step of pronucleus um, joining. So we did a study here where we assess patients that have high DNA fragmentation into the ejaculate. So we look at the deference valves and we go to the chromatin fragmentation was somewhat lower, about 17 to 22%. This assessed by tunnel with the threshold of 15%. If we look at the epididymis, it's about at the threshold level, 15, 16%. In the test is much less than 11%. So, and when we compare the, the same patient in different cycle, you see we got a 62% fertilization with ejaculate and ICSI, but we got about 3% of implantation, 6% of clinical pregnancy, and very few delivery. But if you use surgical retrieval spermatozoa, similar fertilization rate, much higher implantation, that four times higher, 12%, a clinical pregnant 30% and delivery at 22. So we're not told the patient want to undergo a testicular biopsy, knowing that there's spermatozoa in the vagina. So um, there was this paper that we did in 2014 on prospective and chromatic fragmentation. The most important message of this paper was that there is inverse relationship between the proportion of DNA fragmented spermatozoa and the motility of those spermatozoa. So we use this chamber. We actually we use this one, the 800 microliter chamber. And um, this is a preliminary study we did with them. And actually we saw if you use density gradient, we have a reduction in volume, you see from 2.2 ml to 500 microliter. The concentration decreased from 28 million, the raw sample, to about 17 and 8 million for the microfluidic. But the motility increased dramatically to 97% into microfluidic group. And even the morphology, although not clinically meaningful, but improved somewhat. So when you look at the motility here in the raw sample, you can see after density gradient and after microfluidity. 
So we look at the DNA fragmentation, the sample 26%, 18% after density gradient improves somewhat, but after microfluidity less than 2%. So if you look at the 80 couples here, we did 191 cycle prior, this is the demographic, we got the fertilization of 67%. When we did 90 cycle microfluidity, so 68 was similar fertilization. When we look at the clinical pregnancy with density gradient, we got an implantation of 8%, 70% clinical pregnancy, and 7% delivery with a very high pregnancy loss. And we repeat with microfluidic, we got an implantation of 23%, clinical pregnancy 41, and delivery of 36 with a very minute pregnancy loss. So we also profile some individual according to the ability to generate a pregnancy. So we did this by DNA sequencing by NGS. So this was published in Fertility Study in 2022. And we identified fertile, 10 fertile men and 21 fertile men that actually consented to the study. The failure to achieve a pregnancy was because of complete fertilization failure, poor embryo development, implantation failure, or pregnancy loss. And we performed certain assay in the laboratory, PSC, the mouse outside PSC test, we assessed for the centrosome, and here also implantation failure for centrosome and transmission electron microscopy. For the pregnancy loss, we assessed the typical standard um, assay that the BSRM suggests. So we did all exome sequencing. So we identify a certain number of mutations. You know, for the patient with complete fertilization failure, that's uh, mostly the ADAM15. It's important for the interaction between the sperm and um, the DO site. And also this involves the acrosomal development. For the poor embryo development, we need the gene that are involved in, um, in the uh, different centrosome, microtubule, the meiosis and mitosis at the same time. For the implantation failure, we have um, macroautophagy gene involved, interleukin, and the PLK4 important for the, the centrosome. When we look at the pregnancy loss, they are all over the place. We look at the um, tumor suppressor gene, gene are involved in DNA repair mechanism, trophoblast development, SL cycle regulation. So the consideration of this sperm gene mutation are important. This is a sperm gene mutation that we believe they've been acquired in the lifetime of the individual, the people that were born. Because some of these patients had child in the, in the past and um, then suddenly became completely infertile. Doesn't matter what you do to them. So um, this mutation contribute to the reproductive failure. And we had the possibility to tailor that, this diagnostic test. That's what we're trying to do. So um, to kind of use DNA sequencing as a sort of tool for precision medicine to unveil subtle medicine. So then we try to assess these men that have non structures to spend. We assess the ejaculate of this individual looking for spermatozoa, but we don't see any spermatozoa. And we wanted to see if we can get any information on this ejaculate sample in order to predict once they go to the cycle of biopsy, they're going to be spermed there or not. So we did the RNA sequencing in this case. We look at certain genes. What we found different was their neuraminidase and this uh, transmembrane phosphatase gene. They were highly expressed in individuals with presence of spermatozoa at the cycle of biopsy. But if you look for those that they don't have, any spermatozoa at the cycle biopsy, this is completely underexpressed. So then we did DNA sequencing, and we wanted to see if the same gene actually, you see the neuraminidase are synonymous in the patient with sperm, and is uh, actually completely absent mutation, but we do without sperm is frame shift mutation consistent in these 12 patients. And this actually is the list of the gene. Now, the neuraminidase involved for acrosome uh, reaction capacitation and the other one, the, the transmembrane phosphatase is important for the motility. So we don't know if they actually are causative uh, mutation or just simply associate. So we have to keep studying in order to understand more. But we think that is a, a, a non-invasive tool in order to give information to a couple to say if they should go to the cellular biopsy or not. We are also trying to query the proteome, and we look at another set of gene here, or, or gene product better. We found something significant between the patient that have spermatozoa and the one who don't at testicular biopsy, but still we're studying just preliminary, uh, preliminary data. 
Then another thing we have been doing is uh, we published that this year is um, trying to select the gender of the spermatozoa, the sex of the spermatozoa. So we performed a study in people with normal semen parameter, or almost normal, slightly um, suboptimal morphology here. And uh, we are able to enrich for the X and the Y bearing over 80% of the male and the female sperm. So when we try to enrich for the female, we have 52 couple in 70 cycle. These are the demographic of them. And we have 43 couple of 83% of the embryo of the desired sex. 29 have been transferred so far. And we got the clinical pregnant 62% with 52% delivery and going. If we look at the male selection, 46 couple in 50 cycle, the demographic, you see the 40 couple have 87% of the desired um, gender embryo, 21 transfer, 67% of clinical pregnancy and delivery. And this is a clinical trial, I can look it up if you're interested. So it's still ongoing. But we have 80%, we don't have 100%. So we're working with um, uh, Jackson, Kirkham, Brown, and his team to try to identify a complex computational um, program here with AI to see if we can see a difference. Be sorry, between the the female sperm and the male sperm, and we see some initial observation that's a very initial, um, and uh, you can see that there is a difference in the motion of the flagellum between the male versus the female. If we can confirm this, that we can do real time when the time you can the spermatozoa for X, then we can guarantee 100% of the desired um, gender or sex. So then in 1994, uh, we came up with the idea that the centrosome is paternal in head. And we came up with this opinion paper in the human production. So all came up because the time which I coined, we were looking at the difference between the two PN, we know it's dipole, everybody would agree with that. Then we had a one PN, according to Kaufman criteria, this can be applied to dipole. Now we know this is uh, uh, from standard in vitro insemination, about to 20 to 30 to 40% can be diploid. It depends as a synchrony between the, the two PN. But if from IVF, from ICSI, is consistently applied. When we look at the three PN, from IVF, from standard in vitro insemination, due to an additional penetration of spermatozoa, so there is an additional centrosome, and therefore it's mosaic because it's an abnormal spin law. But if from X is consistent with triploid because it's due to the N solution of the second protocol. So when we did the nucleation of these OSI, we were able to get the triploid centros. You can even see this when you look at the morphology of the of the spermatozoa, you see so-called the capitated spermatozoa, you know that you have an abnormal centrosome. And we can do this for instance on pericentric, and we can identify presence and even characteristics of the centrosome. Now this uh, drawing of the proximal centriole, the distal is important as a scaffold for the flagellum of the sperm. So you have here a normal centriole, see this kind of round cogwheel, and here instead is completely in this array. So it is important to form the first sperm master, will allow the just position of the parental pronuclei. And once it replicates, it will allow the first mitotic division, the segregation, to obtain the, seg the correct segregation of the first mitotic division of the chromosome in the early conceptors. So this is a paper we did together with Dr. Albertini very recently. And uh, so we revisited this concept of the centrosome because although we thought it was indispensable, as David think, we have too many dogma and we should kind of revisit to be humble enough and to look into different aspects. So we know that from this paper that there is a central dominance at least in the human and that's from our original paper. But um, we know that dispermic human embryo, they display the mosaicism um, a doom because there is an additional centrosome. But those that are from, uh, actually from mixing can somewhat self-correct, whether because of different line or because there is something else that intervenes. And the idea is this work from other race that actually did in the mouse and rodents, they, they think a complementary compensatory mechanism would come at play and actually would allow even them the, the rodents to evolve without the need for the sperm centriole 
And so this uh, some sort of uh, microtubule organizing center um, would be controlled from the, the chromosome, the canidal core related to it on the centromere, a regulatory protein. So it is possible to have a normal embryo development without the sperm centrosome. So going back from standard in vitro insemination, we got about 65% fertilization, 40% about clinical pregnancy, about 35% delivery. If you do ICSI, we have a higher fertilization rate, but there is to say that the denominator for ICSI is the mature oocyte. If we correct for the retrieval oocyte, the two techniques overlap identically. But so far, a Cornell from these 30 years, we got over 22,000 baby born. So we know that the bottleneck for all assisted reproductive technology, the maternal age. We see that age up to age 35, we have about 41% delivery rate. Age 39, about 31%. And every year thereafter, the chance of delivery decreases to become almost an adult at age 46 and onward. So we also wanted to look at the offspring. So we published this paper on the American Journal of Civic and Ecology, where we did the 16 years of study here, 2,300 children, 400 from IVF, and almost 2,000 from X. We used parent administered questionnaire, it was about three years of age plus minus six months. We used for child development, the ages and stages questionnaire for the child behavior, the child behavior checklist, and the parents list index, et cetera. Well, we know this that IVF and ICSI participants have a comparable static and perinatal outcome. Fewer ICSI conceived children apparently display abnormal development. The degree of spermatogenic failure, the DNA integrity, the, the utilization of camotrypsin or pentoxifan did not affect the children's development. And among the children born for ICSI, those conceived from surgical spermatozoa appear to have a lower risk of abnormality than those conceived from a jaguarism process. And finally, this is a curiosity. They, they know this, we know this in a higher abnormal behavior in those born from cleaver stage embryos, right? Um, here from day three embryo transfer. So we can conclude that ICSI is the ultimate treatment for male fertility. Everybody would agree. And because of ICSI, we are learning about the male gamete function. And the aim is uh, to select the idea spermatozoa. And we're doing that by assessing the genome, the epigenome, and eventually the proteome. And uh, we also wanted to assess the embryo developmental competence, and we need to monitor, continue to monitor the offspring health. One of the knowledge of my collaborator, particularly those in my closer group between the ICSI and the neurology. Thank you very much. Question that the early women involved. Can you throw this line and modify the audience and the audience should have gotten protocol? Can you go back? Can you define that slide? Like, yeah. oh, can you elaborate on the modification? Oh, I think it's like about the modification. Yeah. 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 This was part of the study. That's not mean that we were most there today. All the discussion called us and say, any thought. We got uh, this patient, the moment in the family, no fertilization. Then we look at, at the history of the, the cycle, and we see that there is no fertilization, one per five out of 12 per But then the English one, they were there, the M1, the GV and M1, the following day, we look at those, we try to inject those. If you get fertilization, then we know that the sperm is probably complex. So that doesn't need those outcomes. But something else went wrong. So this is a paper that actually we found in 2018, I believe, um, is a Pereira in the first over. And um, when we look at patients that have normal symptom, complete absence fertilization, 16 patients. And then it came again, and we only tweaked the simulation. What we did, we increased the time between the ACG and the time of the retrieval. We do at least 36 hours. At our center, we do an average 35 hours. And then sometimes you go to physician, some physicians so far, and you bring it we end up with, you know, short, and that's an issue. And then the other thing, the removal of the body, although the ACG administration removed the projection of the corona side from the old side, we know from paper, and everybody of you that they work in, we call it Dr. Albert Finnick and Adley, 
is important the rest of the schools uh, around the outside. We let them sure the sun, not so much the, the, the nucleus of the outside. The structure of the polar code is there clear. Everybody would agree there is no doubt that. But the side we can go on. We know from the individual operations that uh, you need to wait at least one hour when they reach the two stage in order to inseminate, otherwise they don't smoke at all. And that's what Dr. Rendrick mentioned in his talk that you know there is a separate part. In fact, whether it is a mutation, but in this particular case, it's just an epigenetic that is due to the type of signature. So we increase the time between SG and the retriever, the time at least that we want two and a half hours between the retriever and the cumulus removal, and one hour, one hour and a half between the cumulus removal and the injection itself. Okay, so you didn't really change the hormone to stimulate no. the ovaries, no. just the time. I believe in the in vivo and in vitro moderation time. Is it the importance of my gene variants and uh, in association with different? Reproductive failure these types of these pathogenic variants were they or were there were there various levels of significance? Yeah, there there's similar initiative in the patient. I mean there's the um um mutation and then the, the things that we found and, and now we've done some patient it would be the these are the sequences from what's all another picture of time, just on the structure. But then the question we got from some referee said, what about the somatic cell? So we look at the somatic cell, but the mutation is much lower, much better. So we pick up on the somatic cell, certain information we don't get into the peripheral blood. Yeah. And also, and also the fact that these individuals were deprived in for patients, but they were for a lifetime. And you know, the, you know, the work of uh, Nathan Pratt about uh, the polygenic influence. So you look, know, these are obviously polygenic. And they still think they've occurred in our lifetime, depending on the environmental exposure, um, the individual health, etc. It can all affect the fertility of the individual. It's not just one thing, but the all the organic um, individual contribute. Yeah. Thank you very much for that lovely clinical talk. It's coffee break time. Um, and we are going to reconvene here. We'll give you about only about 10 minutes. We'll reconvene here. Well, maybe we can give you 15 at 3.30 or 3.35 for the next portion of our Italian adventures. Mm -hmm.